Oftentimes we get hung up on the physiological benefits of some of the things we do, when in fact, many, if not most of the benefits simply come from the following, doing hard things. Doing things that are hard changes your relationship to struggle, to pain and to challenge. And that will change everything for you. So do hard things for the simple fact that they're hard. Watch what happens. Uh, this right here, I'm going to sound like an old man, but uh, this is real wisdom, oh, like yeah. real wisdom. And it's a lost art. As I, you know, the, the, the deeper I, I get into this and the more I understand it, the more I understand people like my father and his father and my relatives, uh, my older relatives who grew up very, very hard, very hard and how they are just happy and joyful and when they're doing really hard things, don't seem to like trip out. And then yeah. I do things that are like, you know, a quarter of the challenge and I'm like ready to kill myself. And really what it is, is that their, their relationship to these things is completely different, completely different. Changes your perspective. And it's because they, they did hard things all the time. Yeah, yeah. All the time. You know, when he was, he likes to tell me this story when I was a kid, when I was a kid, you know, when your, your dad tells you stuff, you're like, whatever, dad. You know, the whole, like, I used to walk uphill 15 <laughs> miles both ways type of deal. I love those stories, yeah. He's like, you know, when we were kids, uh, obviously we had a much better off than he did. He grew up extremely poor. And, um, you know, we'd get toys for Christmas and stuff. And then he did the whole lecture and he's like, you know what I used to play with? They're like, what? And he goes, I used to play with sticks. <laughs> like, I used to play with sticks. He goes, I had one toy when I was a kid. Yeah. And I'm like, what was it? And he goes, he, he tells us over and over. He found a bicycle tire. <laughs> he found it. it was a bicycle a rim. <laughs> at like that a kid dump. that like rolls it with a stick. I like guess <laughs> yeah. like it was his street. It was his favorite toy. They would yeah. roll it and they'd play with it all the time. And I remember as a kid thinking like he's making that up. That's not. You couldn't possibly have fun. But and again, I'm not trying to trivialize anybody's challenges. But doing hard things does uh, have an effect on how you handle challenge. And, uh, you know, one way to do this is start the day off with something hard or challenging. Everything else seems easier. So if you ever wonder, because I often wonder how some people can go through things uh, and other people can go through the same things and just have a completely different mm -hmm. experience. It's not that they, you know, this person feels more pain. This person feels, they have a different relationship. There's the objective thing that's happening. Then there's a subjective experience of what's happening. And that right there is probably everything. You know? I mean, it's almost like a psychological muscle, right? Totally. Like, like you're you're building it, you're strengthening it uh, by introducing almost this hormetic stress, like just like little bits of uh, really challenging things. So that way too, like you get something real and you, you don't completely go into shock and freak out and think that the world's ending. It's like, you know, okay, I've navigated through some of these hard things before, and this is how I got to like pursue through this. Yeah. You know, it was this way of thinking that shifted my perspective on my childhood. And it didn't happen for me until like my mid to late twenties. Um, and I wish I remember if I was like, if it was the therapy that I was going through or it was talking to a client but I know I was like having to dig into like my old, like grow the way I grew up and everything. And then what led to today. And I, the, I remember the more I had to talk about it, the more I realized that like, oh man, because of the adversity as a kid, once I got to adulthood, the challenges, just like everybody has their, their struggles and challenges when you get into adulthood seemed so trivial in comparison. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize like, oh, because I was uh, forced to go through these hard things when I was younger, the adult things that I went through seemed, oh, this is not a big deal. Yeah. I've been through harder stuff that's way mm -hmm. harder than that many more times. So this is like one little bump in the road. And I never like I, it, when I was going through that, I didn't realize I had that perspective. I got, gained that perspective uh, unwillingly as a kid. But it served me so well as an adult, and so now, like the the, the way I frame my child is like, man, I'm so grateful. I wouldn't change anything about it. I'd rather yeah. go through that. And I think in today's time, uh, because of technology, because of uh, the, the the ability for so many more people to have, we've lifted so many more people out of poverty today than say three decades ago. That more and more, I think it's important that we force ourselves into these challenging things, which we've speculated before that this has a big deal to do with the the rise in like Spartan races and things like yeah. that is that mm -hmm. deep down, I think we want that. We seek that we need that. So to have perspective for. Yeah. And just to support you, Adam, you're one of the most resilient people I know. So I know you're not, you know, for anybody listening, yep. he's not just saying that for the show. Like I know him, I've seen him go through things 
and the guy's extremely resilient and it comes because of how you grew up. You know, it, an important thing to, to mention with this is, because it's like exercise, right? Physiologically, you stress your body, it gets damaged, but then it strengthens and becomes stronger so that next time that same damage doesn't cause damage. But you can over apply damage and overcome your body's ability to adapt. So this can happen with challenge as well. Because there's somebody listening right now that's like, oh no, I went through some trauma and it didn't make me stronger. If anything, it made me weaker. Well, you have. You, there's always a right dose and that dose is different from person to person. And as you progress, that dose can change. So you can definitely overcome your, your ability to grow and strengthen from hard things. Now, uh, back to what you were saying about how modern society you know, and technology has kind of made things easy. More than ever, more than ever, do we have to choose to put hard things in our life? We have yeah. to actually consciously do this, which probably is more challenging than what it used to be in the past where you had no choice but to go through hard things. Yeah. Like hard things were just, that was life. Life was hard. Now life is just easy. So you have to like put- Set an intention for your day. Like I have to seek out these uh, things that are that make me uncomfortable. Otherwise, yeah, it's not even really going to present itself anymore. Uh, you know, even being in an environment like this where we have like air, air controlled, like AC, yep. you have heat, you have, um, you know, soft chairs. Like I, I just can just sit and be happy, play video games. I could put my VR on and, and, and just do nothing. Yeah. But, you have to choose it. By the way, this is the real argument for the cold plunge. Yeah, 100%. You, this is what, yes. right now the space is debating back and forth on the science of muscle gaining and growth, which is so crazy and funny to me because what is it? Well, there's something else. Oh, fasting. Fasting is another one of those things that I remember when we first- It's because fitness, uh, um, uh, they, they, they only value the look. They don't, they, so anything that has all this other value, oh, it might burn body fat, it might build muscle. Let's just focus on that. Yeah. That's what's happening. Yeah. And I feel like we're doing that again with the cold plunge. It's like- we, we know that there's value in it, it or else it wouldn't be a practice that's been around forever. And we've now got lots of great science that supports all these different benefits that come from it. The one that the, the fitness science community uh, uh, clings on to is the you know muscle building recovery aspect of it. And then that takes uh, gets traction and gets popular. Now there's this counter movement. Now it's this big argument over one aspect of this. And it's not even the biggest aspect, I think, not even the biggest contributor to to your life it's this the conversation that we're having right now which totally reminds me of when the fasting thing happened fasting same exact cycle it was been around forever we know that it's been practiced for thousands of years uh, so we get some science to support the health benefits that support it. So what does the fitness community do? They glom on to the, just the science part of the, the, the potential fat loss and neurogenesis and all these things. Yep. And then it's like, and then you have the other people that counter like, oh, that's so splitting hairs and that's bullshit. And then they're all arguing over the wrong thing. No, yeah. listen, <laughs> fasting is, is, is existed in every major religion um, that exists today. Every major religion has fasting in it. Do, and it's lasted for thousands of years. Were they fasting to get leaner? I mean, we're talking thousands of years ago. Nobody was trying to get leaner. <laughs> yeah, no. There was nobody was like, I need no. to lose some weight. Okay. Right. That, that In was, fact, that was probably very high risk to do something exactly. silly like yes. that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you want to fast? Like yeah. you already kind of fasted last week because we, you know, <laughs> right. we didn't find any food. We may not. We're we not in eat, famine. Yeah. We yeah. might not eat next week. <laughs> right. Uh, cold plunge, like putting yourself into cold water. Do you think that they were doing that hundreds of years ago? to speed up recovery mm. or to produce more, you know, catecholamines, muscle, build more muscle, norepinephrine. Do <laughs> yeah. you think they were debating over the muscle gain? They didn't care about that. They cared about the real value. By the way, uh, exercise and strength training went through a similar path. Strength training initially, nobody cared about the muscles and the look. That was a side effect. It was about the function. It was about mm. feeling good. You read some of these old books, that were you know from the late 1800s. Read about it. Nobody's talking about building bigger biceps or you know. It's all about more function, vitality, vigor. You know, less pain, not feeling weak, not getting sick. And then of course, what happens is people notice like, oh, this you know Eugene Sandow, he kind of looks really good. Everybody starts worshiping the look, and then we value it for the side effect, for yeah. the the effect that's not really the main thing. So. Going into a cold plunge, are there physiological benefits? Yes. There's, there's lots of science now to support it. But here's the real benefit. It's not that I get in and I see catecholamine production and I see immune system boosting and all that. Here's the real value is every time I think about getting into the cold plunge, I don't want to. Eventually, I get over that. 
if I keep practicing it, I get comfortable jump. Cause let me tell you something right now I can, and I'll say this with hundred percent certainty, nobody who cold plunges, you don't all of a sudden, uh, don't get freezing cold and it doesn't shock you. It no, always it, does. It's hard every time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The difference is you develop this resilience exactly. and this relationship with a it. Mindset. Where, yeah. Where I get, for me, I have to like talk myself into it, mm -hmm. but I could see how practicing it every day at some point, I'm going to be, I'm just going to do it. And then God, is that going to have carryover to the rest of my life? hundred percent. You better believe it. So if you view your practices, uh, with this kind of, um, understanding, even eating healthy, even eating healthy is this way. There's definitely value and enjoyment of eating, but there's also the value and enjoyment of not eating the hyper palatable stuff and enjoyment of eating food because of its other benefits. And by the way, that's, we talk about all the time. That's how you get to this like yeah. intuitive balanced eating for the rest of your life. When you go through, uh, through that challenge and when you understand it that way, now you start to, by the way, now you start to not only get the real value, but all those like silly side effects that the fitness industry worships, like sculpted mm -hmm. abs and you look great and you're sexy and your muscles, that all happens anyway. That's well, all going to happen anyway. Yeah. And I think in our space, we've, we've been so focused on the body in terms of building and, um, you know, uh, displaying strength and displaying, uh, the benefits of that. And we haven't really dived into like, you know, building up your, your mental strength and being able to be resilient. And especially in today's world, like, uh, I just look at it as like you're you're reinforcing and fortifying uh, this house before an impending storm comes, right? Like you, you need to be uh, thoughtful in that regard in terms of uh, being able to keep like mentally strong and when facing challenges. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm gonna, I'll I'll ask you, Justin, because you played at a pretty high level of football. So, and it's like this for uh, like boxing, for example. You can learn all the techniques. You could be big and strong. Um, you could be fast and agile. But if you've never been hit, there's a learning curve <laughs> yep. that comes from being able to uh, have a relationship with getting your, your, your bell rung mm -hmm. because you got hit in the field. So, And if you've never done it before, you, you're not going to be able to, to, to operate. Just like fighters. like You could practice the moves. You could practice their techniques. You could have it all perfect. But everything goes out the window when you get punched in the face. Unless you practice getting punched in the face yeah. and you know how to roll with the punches. right? That's where that, that term comes from. Um, I, I have to imagine football's like that because I can imagine getting hit hard and being yeah. like, oh, I got to get used to this. It's not easy. It's not something that's comfortable. It literally, the first time it even happened for me, because I was late to uh, football where all my friends played Pop Warner and like they were like really understood the game and, and the physics and, you know, really had to apply like the ultimate uh, force towards somebody and like knock them on their ass. And like, I didn't know any of this stuff, like stepping into it, like as a freshman, my parents didn't want me to play until high school. And so I come in a bit late and like all my friends really wanted me to play. I'm like, okay. And I'm out there and I'm just kind of running around with this helmet that's like really heavy and like my neck soft and, <laughs> and I just didn't know what I was doing. And, and the very first play where I was like uh, trying to figure out if I was going to play defense or offense, um, I was on defense and we were in this drill and, and this running back who was just, I mean, he was my same size, but they just really understood like leverage and just came in and just literally decleated me and, and hit me so hard. It was like a shock through my whole body. And, and I, I was on the ground and it knocked the wind out of me. And I was trying to like gather myself and I'm like, Phew. I could have just cried and just left at that point. Like that, I could have had that reaction. Mm -hmm. Well, what is the what is the science behind that, right? Okay, so I've both football and fighters. I've heard say this before, where like people are asking, like you know, oh, I think I want to get into fighting, and they say that you know, after the very first time that you've been hit like that, there's a certain type of person, yeah, that gets hit like that. And is there something that is there is there a chemical or internal or psychological reaction that only certain people <laughs> they receive that, and it yeah. doesn't make them go, oh my God. Cause the natural reaction for most people yep. in a situation like that, like we're, we're, we've evolved this way. You get hit, you get hurt like that. The body goes, oh, you don't yeah. want to do this. Yeah. It's fight, so, flight. So what is it about a, a certain breed of person that gets punched in the nose really hard for their first time ever <coughs> and they want to come back for more or gets decleated like that and they go, as much as it hurt, they go, 
Oh, okay, let me do that again. It's got to be. It's yeah. it's got to be mindset. Like it, it's. You gotta, think it's all that? It is. Because here's the th here's why I'm not sure about that. Because uh, you just got done. You know. Yeah, uh, you might be able praising, to develop it, but you got, done, pretty... you got done praising me about mine, and, and I appreciate that. But I'll tell you something right now. When I played football, I was I was like, this is not for me. And part of what made me go this is that was getting knocked on, getting rocked like that. Now I was yeah. a little kid. I wasn't even even at the level. Justin, I was a young kid playing Pop Warner. But it rang my bell enough to go like, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. I think different challenges pose different challenges for people. Because I'm, I, I, I can also ask you this: when you get punched in a, fight, you got a lot of fights when you were a kid. Yeah. Did you do the same thing? No. That yeah. Was, so yeah. So I think it's just different, different, different situations. Yeah. Like you, you might take an athlete who who does that and gets excited, like gets like, okay, I'm going to keep doing this. You might put them on a stage in front of a crowd. Or you might have them take a test. Yeah, I was just curious if you knew because I don't I, know. I do know that there's like there is yeah. something about that though, right? Have you not heard? I've also heard the same thing before from like fighters and then football players. And you definitely, if Justin, you grew up yeah. in that in, on the field, like mm -hmm. there's definitely guys that went yeah. in it with all excited, and then they come, they don't come back, you know, for a reason. Yeah, and it's interesting too because you'll you'll see that in like different arenas, like in, in MMA or like in yeah. a kind of martial art or something. Like in some of the the um, schools uh, will test that right away because they don't want they don't want the person with the mindset that is like immediately sort of cowers away and is is like not uh, responding the way that they want. They want the one that immediately is like ooh yeah. like yeah like it, it clicks and, and fires something inside them yeah. Uh, and so I I kind of respect that on on a level because it's it, it is sort of, it's like it's listen I'm gonna put all my effort in. Um, and teaching towards somebody that's like that receptive, you know, and I, and I want you in to, mm -hmm. to keep learning versus somebody that's like that. You just know, like maybe there's a chance for them down the road to, to, to build and develop that kind of uh, excitement and, and discipline to, to excel in it. But it's, that's a lot longer of a, a journey and a path versus somebody like that, where you're like, okay, they have that, they have the thing, yeah. whatever that thing is. Yeah, probably. Right. Cause there's, there's going to be different, uh, variances for what they can tolerate and, and how they progress. I think it goes back to your dose. Yeah, right? yeah. So I think I think that's the important thing. Like if, if you're listening to this right now, that you you there's an appropriate dose of stress. So I'm saying do hard things. Well, don't do something so hard that you break your leg and you can't work, or something that's going to overwhelm you. Or cause right. Trauma. There's still a healthy relationship to have with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Because then there's people that are that are almost uh, was it uh, masochistic? Oh yeah. Where, yeah. where, where they, they want they just they yeah just, yeah they're just hurting themselves at that point. Yeah, yeah. I remember the first time I got it thrown. Yeah, I was a pain seeker. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. You also yeah, delivered. Get a little bit of a borderline that. Yeah, let's be honest. You're also a pain deliverer. <laughs> yeah. I remember the first time I got thrown by a national level judo competitor, and it was definitely terrifying. <laughs> well, I mean, you get thrown fast. Yeah. The the world spins very quick, and then you hit was the ground. A hip toss. Real thing? hard. I mean, uh, what did he throw me with first? No, he threw me with a Tayotoshi, which is a, a side throw. And it, it, if you get it, do it, get it right, the dude turns over very quick. So it was like, boom. <laughs> and I remember going, okay, that, wow. yeah, I got to sit here for a couple minutes to catch myself. But I mean, the whole point with this is that there's value in simply choosing to do hard things for the value, for the simple fact that it's hard, mm -hmm. not just all the other stuff. So like, okay, you brought up cold plunge, Adam. Here's why I like the cold plunge so much. Let's say you're a busy individual. You got a family, you work a lot. You're like, okay, I hear this whole like practice hard things. Like how do I squeeze this into my day? How do I make this happen? Well, uh, you could now, you could actually do this now. They make it real convenient. We work with a company um, called Plunge where you could buy a plunge. It's it's filtered. It's all it takes care of itself, okay? So you have it in your house and two minutes. You can start your day off with a two minute hard ass thing yeah. every day and that's it. And that will have a profound impact on your ability to to chat to to take on challenges the rest of the day. Yeah, that's yeah. my whole point, yeah. you know, with yeah, this yeah. whole thing. Today's giveaway, Maps Anabolic Advanced. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll notify you in the comment section. We're also running a sale right now on some of our correctional exercise, pain relieving pro mobility workout programs. Maps Prime is 50% off. Maps Prime Pro is 50% off. And then the bundle that includes both of them that's also already discounted 30% off, you can take an additional 50% off. If you're interested in any of these, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Anyway, I got to tell you guys, I'm going to talk about hard things. Man, <laughs> I had a terrifying... 
experience uh, the other night. Terrifying. Yeah. So Last I was, night or night before? Night before. Okay. So um, I was, uh, so <clears throat> Jessica has been, we've been had this cold kind of going around the house here for a while. Lingery, like this long kind of lingery cold. Mm. And Jessica was getting progressively worse. Like she had this cold, but then I told you guys, I said, I think she has mono because my older son had mono mm. and uh, mono can be really nasty with the sore throat, the whole deal. She started getting this really sore throat. And so I'm like, uh oh, I think she's got mono. This is going to kind of suck, but whatever. Well, anyway, um, it got little by little progressively worse. And uh, that the day before, she was like, my throat is so like swollen. And she started developing this like cough where she would get this like these fits where she would just cough, cough and mm. couldn't catch her breath. I'm like, oh man, this really sucks. I was supposed to go to LA to do some podcasts the day, the day after. So I'm like, okay, well, I think she's okay type of deal. She's just, you know, not feeling well. Well, anyway, tw- uh, what was it like 1 a.m.? So I'm downstairs sleeping on the couch because she feeds the baby in the middle of the night. And um, I had, you know, I want to get some sleep before I went to LA. And 1 a.m., I hear her coming, like I hear her gasping for air coming down the stairs. And I'm like, oh, wow. what's going on? What's going on? And she couldn't catch her breath. She couldn't. I thought, we're going to have to go to the ER. She's like. She's super swollen. Swollen, coughing, had like almost like almost no voice to the point where like I'm trying to talk to you, can't hear anything. And uh, you start to get a little panic and we're trying to calm down. What do we do? And, you know, she finally started to kind of like be able to breathe a little bit and, you know, and then it kind of got a little bit better. And I'm like, oh, this is like scary. Like, is it, is it allergic, allergic reaction? Is this, you know, anaphylactic shock? And we're watching and I got the Benadryl ready. Um, well, anyway, we were able to kind of make it through the night. Next day, we try to make an appointment with a doctor. They're like, oh, you can come next week. I'm like, no, we need to come in now. So they're like, well, what are your symptoms? We tell them, like, go to urgent care. We go to urgent care and they run like all these different tests. They do mono, COVID, um, strep throat, uh, whooping cough. So yeah. the nurse heard her cough. Mm-hmm. She tested her for whooping cough. I'm like, well, wow, this is a, a 19th like a century degree. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I hope it's not that because we've got babies at home. But um, but they're they're like well just to be sure but you know low low chance anyway everything came back negative and the doctor said basically that and I had no idea so what do you guys know about laryngitis oh I just knew that like it made it so you couldn't really talk that yeah. was like literally all I know yeah I'm like oh it's yeah. not a big deal you just you lose your voice a little bit I get yeah. that all the time when I do lots of speaking engagements that's it that's my extent you can get. So I, I read up on this because this, this might be what happened. It's induced by virus or bacterial infection. She doesn't have bacterial infection, so it's viral. Did you guys know that laryngitis can get so bad that someone will have to get intubated in the hospital? Well, they literally have to like put a tube down your throat so you can breathe? Wow. wow. It could get so swollen, and there's a part of the throat that could get swollen that will block the windpipe. Mm, yeah, to yeah. make you not be able to breathe. Yeah, yeah. That's and the, scary, dude. on the high end, it, you get coughing fits. Where and you you start to get real swollen, and so that's probably where she's at. So like right now, like so last night, we're you know she's sleeping. We're sleeping outside the room because she coughs all night, wakes up the baby. She <clears throat> can't sleep. She literally will start to doze off and wake herself up, choking and coughing. Ugh. And then we're doing like the humidifier, oh doing God. all the natural stuff to keep her from the whatever. Doctor wrote us a prescription for some strong ass narcotic cough you know, medicine that we're kind of waiting on because otherwise she can't she can't breastfeed the baby. So we're like, let's see what happens. I had no idea. Well, promethazine or whatever is that, that Oh, is? I don't remember the name of it, but uh, I think it's the one people take to get high. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's what that is. Is it? Comes okay. in a little brown bottle. Yeah, well, we didn't yeah. get it because like, she's like really, she's super like, no, I'm breastfeeding. But man, talk about, like we're at urgent care. I, I'm take, <clears throat> we're taking the baby because we had to leave the, the toddler at home with nanny. And, uh, you know, on the way there, she's like, and, and she'll cough so much that she'll lose her breath and then she'll regain herself and then do it again and then regain herself. I'm like, this is fuck. scary, dude. <laughs> so crazy. Yeah. You know, I, you, when I hear this story about you, I can't help but think, you know, I always talk about your greatest strength is your greatest weakness, right? Yeah. I swear that because you were definitely the guy, if, if any of us were trying to figure something out, one of us will, will text you. We'll probably text you. <laughs> hey, Sal, this is that because we can, we can count uh-huh. on you to probably, oh, it's the... But you probably do this to yourself 
so much when something happens. And I know you do because you do it to even me when I tell you, yeah. like, oh, yeah, Max got a sniffle. And you're like, check this, make sure it's not this, yeah. this, this, this. It could be this, this is going around. So I'm like, bro, you have to, like, stress yourself out yeah, so dude. much with the, sure. the information that you know in regards to that stuff. Like, Well, so I wasn't even uh, – I thought – I wasn't super stressed out. Uh, really? At the, not at this point. Okay. I wasn't super. See, I don't believe this. <laughs> no, no, no. You're right. I could definitely do that. But because my oldest had mono, you just defaulted I thought, to oh, that. she's got mono. So that's what it is. It's okay. going to take time to go away. Right. I freaked out when she woke me up at 1 a.m., uh -oh. couldn't catch her breath, and was having trouble breathing. Yeah, that would be scary. Well, uh -huh. you know what went through my head was, uh, am I going to have time to jam to the ER? I got the babies here. Should I just wake them up? And or do like, now this is, now this is the Sal thing, okay? How do you do a tracheotomy? Like if she loses her, oh, her ability yeah. to breathe, <laughs> am I gonna have to cut through her? You already think about slitting her throat, You're watching bro. videos. <laughs> like, okay, so that's like, how crazy yeah. you are. I'm so the opposite. I'm so the opposite that thank God Katrina has a little it's bit of nuts. that, so we probably bounce each other. But I'm the opposite. I'm like so bad. Walk like, it off. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, ah, he'll be fine. Rub some tests like, on it. He's yeah. not breathing really well. This and that. Like, ah, he'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> Open the Kids window. are resilient. That's what I say. <laughs> Uh -huh. His legs broke. Yeah, Walk it off. I'm so, It'll grow back. I'm so bad. But I, I, I mean, if I think if I was like, if I think so, okay, are you? Or Jessica, it was the breathing thing that freaked me are out. Are you and Jessica, though, alike in that area? Because you could probably do that to each other. Is she more like you or is she more like me? No. Uh, we actually balance each other out. If one of us goes in that direction, the other person tends to call the other person down, uh, which okay. is kind of cool. Okay. It's usually me going mm -hmm. in that direction, though. Yeah. But it was the breathing thing that got <coughs> me going. Because when she started Yeah, that would that, scare me. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. that's like, that's like yeah, this she, is emergency. Yeah, you can't mm -hmm. breathe, you can't talk. It's that's, different than like, oh, my God, I'm so sick. I need to go to the doctor. Right, it's right. more like can't get words out yeah what the fuck is going on yeah you know <clears throat> and like are we going to call 911 or what's happening but and I, I had no idea laryngitis and it's rare but i had no idea because you hear laryngitis you're like laryngitis that's why you went to the urgent yeah. care oh no apparently it could get so bad that you're totally yeah i wouldn't even i've been completely oblivious even how to treat it yeah. anything like, well yeah. the, the issue... you didn't slit her throat so oh <laughs> you imagine she's coughing <laughs> i hold it down <laughs> <laughs> I got you, honey. I got an exacto <laughs> knife in the garage. <laughs> Cut the wrong part. Blood coming out. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> oh, she stopped coughing. Bro, I have a she stopped breathing. I have a uh, crazy, embarrassing, uh, and weird, all the above story. You poop your pants again? No, listen to this. Okay. So <clears throat> I gotta set the table for the audience because you guys know, like, and I've shared stories before. Okay, remember, remember when we went to the. Uh, the fitness convention long time ago when we first were starting to come up and I, I thought the girls wanted to take a photo with me. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Remember, how that San Jose? remember how embarrassing yeah, that was? Remember how embarrassing that was? Okay, awesome. so for the audience, Wait, that, yeah, yeah, okay. for the audience yeah. that, that hasn't been listening for One that long, favorites. when we first, and this is like year two, we were pretty new, but we were starting, you know, we were getting in the top 25 of new podcasts and things like that and we were getting some traction. Every once in a while we would be recognized places. So like, <laughs> it was the beginning of the growth, right? I felt like right? we were cockier back then oh, even God, now. For sure. I'm way more humble. Our, our yeah. self-belief is always higher than it's our like, actual. Wow. Yeah. So we were all in the we're in the, the heat of that. We're at a fitness convention, so we're already in our little bubble. So a, a group of all these young, cute girls come over to me and uh, you know, hey, can we take a picture? They come up to me and I I think they mean they want me to take a picture. And I'm but, like, yeah, but, sure. Can I add to this? The yeah. look Adam had on his face. Hold on. <laughs> they go because also you were at like the you were at the tail end of like like physique competition. Yeah, yeah. So I'm all jacked. And looking. sometimes you would get recognized for that. Yeah, yeah. So these girls are like, can I take a picture? And they hand, you know, and they come up to Adam. And Adam looks at us like, oh, here we go. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. They <laughs> Pulled my beer. Yeah, they want to yeah, take a picture. Yeah, yeah. They want to take a picture with me. But yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> well, here we go again. Anyways, the girls hand me the phone. They don't know who the fuck that I am. They just want me to take a picture of their group of girls, right? So that, <laughs> that was embarrassing. Oh, but no. also very good for me to have experienced that early on because I always seem to come from this angle. And so I think going forward up until last night i haven't had one of these moments again so i'm at the warrior game again katrina and i and uh you know every time we go i there's probably one or two people uh that that do come up to me and, and recognize recognize me from the show um i've told you guys before people i've had uh, tnt people that work for tnt for the uh work for the warriors and uh for the jp morgan chase center like so we've had all these different people that I've done this. So every time I go, there's at least one or two that, that actually do this. Mm -hmm. So I can preface this a little bit. So last night had already ran into somebody who had said hi, took a picture with them and stuff like that. And we're sitting down. This is warm ups are going <clears throat> and Katrina and I, and here comes one of the ushers 
and uh, her and I are sitting, we're sitting down in our seats and she comes over and she, she pokes her head in, like puts her arm on my shoulder, puts her arm in, comes over with a smile. And she starts telling me that, um, you know, excuse me, sir, I really uh, appreciate that you uh, mind uh, your business and, you know, be courteous to others. And, and she's kind of like going on and on about how, you know, not to be rude and that to be respectful and all this stuff like that. And Katrina and I are like kind of looking at each other and smiling like, oh, she's a fan. Like she's like fucking with me and she's going to do something <laughs> like that. And so Katrina and I like are begin like she keeps going on and on about how you know, it's really important and that, you know, I pushed this guy and all this, like <laughs> saying all this stuff. Right. And, and Katrina and I are la we started laughing out loud. Like, <laughs> like Katrina and I are both like waiting for her to like give the punchline or whatever. And she goes, you know, this is actually kind of a serious matter and stuff like that. We could actually ask you to leave the game from now and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm like laughing in this girl's face. And it, it, like, finally, like she doesn't stop. And Katrina goes, are, are you serious? And she goes, oh, yeah, no, I'm very serious. This, this man is extremely irate right now. And I look at Katrina, and I'm like, oh, you, you really, you really, you really, and, and her and I, then her and I have a moment where we kind of laugh. And she goes, oh, my God. She, and she's, thank God she's kind of like stood up for me to, and goes, oh, my God, I totally thought you knew who my husband was and you wanted a photo and this and that. And she's like, who are you? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like oh, God. So now I'm, oh, in, no. so now I'm embarrassed. But then I go like, what, what happened? So supposedly... I pushed some guy as I was walking through the tunnel, who's like some veteran who's sitting down courtside also. And he complained to the usher, pointed me out. The guy in the red hat just shoved me. And he, supposedly he was irate. Now, the craziest part about this, what the craziest part was like, I took, I cannot recall. So I asked the lady, I said, could you point him out so I could apologize? Well, it was obviously an accident. Yeah. I was like, I, I said, I said, please, please tell me who it is so I could go say, I'm sorry. She's like, no, he's really irate. I don't want to make a big scene about it. So that I just want, please. And I'm like, ma'am, I'm like, I literally have no idea what you were talking about right now. I did. And, and then she leaves. Right. And so Katrina's like, what'd you do? And I'm like, honey, I literally have no fucking idea. Now, granted, when you walk through these tunnels, there's thousands of people, you know, there was probably two different people that I like, you know, wedge between and I, and I put my hand on their back. Yeah. You know, but when I do that, it's normally like I you make. You can't really get small easy. You have to walk like this. You yeah. Know? It's so like, okay, on. and the reason why I bring this up, just the other day on the podcast, you got you brought up my height and being a yeah, big guy yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. This yeah. is what I fucking don't like. Yeah. Like here is an example of, and, and America Katrina was just like, oh my god, my husband literally is like the sweetest man ever. He would never do that. Like. That's not him. And, you know, please let him know so he can go Paul. I was like, man, I'll go say I'm sorry right now. Like, I would never want to do that, especially some veteran old guy or something, I guess. I don't know. And I guess I shoved him according to shoulder and old guys. Dude. dude. And I, it was, did it, you get a chance to say crazy. sorry to him? Just no, okay. they, they wouldn't tell me who it was. Oh, cause they didn't know if you might retaliate or something. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think after she saw the way we acted and everything like that, that I was, I wasn't angry at all. I was really just perplexed by That's so weird. Yeah. And I, I racked my brain. I said, there was two, there was two situations just now when I walked to the tunnel, I said, one, there's a there's a one of the guys that I know that that is a regular there. He, sit, he sits courtside and stuff like that. Same dude, Edward. Everybody knows him. Like if you sit down there and you're it's your season ticket holder, all the ushers know who you are and stuff like sure. that. So I go, oh, was it was it Edward? Was it his friend? And she goes, uh, no, it wasn't Edward. And I'm like, oh, I don't because when he was he was standing and he was talking to some older guy. And they were in the, the the tunnel way as I came through, and the ushers. I'm walking up, and 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 the usher walks over to him and and asked him to move out of the way because they're like standing in the mm -hmm. center. And I kind of, I slapped him on the back and like grabbed him. Hey, get out of the way because I knew who he was. And, yeah. and he like looked startled and he looked up and he recognized me. And he oh hey, and and, and then I just kept walking. So you think maybe his friend, maybe his fr and maybe he didn't communicate to his friend that oh I know that guy because and I did come off kind of abrasive at that moment, and so. Maybe it was that guy. And then the only other person was somebody, like I said, I was coming in to, to cut into the court and I just like, I, I turned myself sideways and put my hand on somebody's butt. But I'm telling you right now, I didn't even, there was no nudge. There was not even pressure. It was like a, it come off almost like, like yeah. too soft. Like oh, it was oh, not. Maybe that's what it was. Was it a little? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> was it a low back? He was, was, was lower on his back. <laughs> was than it I a Kyle Kingsbury back touch? Yeah. But <laughs> she was even. <laughs> she, the way she said to me, she's like, you know, it's you know, because she realized how sorry I was, and that she's like, it is. It's 2023. You know, and people get offended really easy. So she was cool yeah. about it eventually, but it was like. I was so embarrassed because I told Katrina and I totally thought like we were laughing at her. She's like talk, kept talking. We're like, 
<laughs> like waiting for the. So in her head, she's wow. like, "This dickhead." Is yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so, but then we again, we're like, yeah. "Oh my god, I'm so sorry." And thank God I had Katrina to like, you know, because I could have been laughing myself, and then she'd been, "This guy's a prick," yeah. but she yeah. was too. I hear so. what you're saying. You're, you're a tall guy, kind of a big guy, sleeve tattoo. You know, you got your hat on, your goatee. Like somebody, if they think that already, they're gonna look at you and think. Oh, he's you know he's a dick or he's being aggressive or whatever. Right. Yeah, I, I get I get what you're saying. I mean, it was so crazy. This is when people think appearances don't matter. They do, man. They do. You, oh, if you, mm -hmm. you you present yourself a particular way, then people have a filter, and that's just life. It sucks because you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. I believe yeah. that. <laughs> so there's right that's just box. life, dude. Yeah. So there's actually a, so a really good book called um, How Emotions Are Made. Um, it was actually one of my favorites. It's a bit of a oh, deep. I remember. That was like a year or two. Yeah, uh, year. It's actually a few years ago, and I've I've talked about it on the podcast a long time ago. Um, it's Nobel winning prize uh, uh, psychologist that wrote the book, and um, really, really good. I believe it is. If I'm getting the same people right, um, but it was it it talks about that. Like even like the way we 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 quickly default to like someone being racist. You know, because they act a certain way. Like, for example, you've heard of people like, oh, when, you know, I see the, you know, this Mexican guy or this black guy walking, I, I cross the street. And so, oh, that's so racist to yeah. do that. And they actually talk about that in the book. That's like, listen, if, if, if your brain has had a situation where, and, you know, it's great. We'll talk to Adam Smith today about stuff like this, where you have had an encounter, a bad encounter. Anybody that if, looks like that. It's right. Yeah. It, it's not like it's your brain naturally. It's not like something that you are innately racist mm -hmm. because that it's be, your brain is trying to protect you because it knows that it data points. And yeah, that's right. It's like the last three times this uh, a Mexican guy with a beanie on with that are in his 20s yeah. saw you. He either caused yeah. trouble or talked Somebody shit to you. Somebody with a neck tattoo. I'm like, right. Yeah, and like, so yeah, the, the brain already associates with that and it's there to protect you. This to default. A, and so sometimes it's just a natural reaction to do that not because you're inherently like oh i hate mexicans or black people yeah. it's like no it's just like that's how the brain works yeah the there's place. it all it, it, and, and there's lots of factors that can factor into that like media can make you start to believe uh certain mm -hmm. stereotypes because you see them on the tv or you see them on the news but like to use a less uh controversial example this is when you get uh you know women hating men and and, and women that hate uh, sorry uh men that hate women and women that hate men like a woman who may have gotten assaulted or had three or four terrible relationships, all of a sudden, all men are dogs. All men. Yeah. Or a guy. This happens to yeah. guys quite a bit. Well, they'll they'll get cheated on two times, and then all of a sudden they're like, women, you know, yeah, yeah rejected women rejected constantly. Yeah, like they're they're only good for this, and I never would trust a woman. They're the greatest light. And you hear guys talk about talk like this sometimes, and you know you had some bad experiences. Your brain generalizes automatically. Yeah. It's yeah. it's got to be a constant check. Yeah. But on the other side, that's. Like we can't deny nature, and what I mean by that is to to like this is just everybody operates this way. You're yeah. all, everybody's brain does. This is why I mean I'm excited about uh, I'm alluding to a, us getting to interview Adam Smith because he's an evolutionary psychologist, and that's the type of stuff that they study and research. Is that you know there's a there's still a part of us uh, that has this kind of animal instinct to do things that were that has been built into us for a reason, and so. And it's not to justify those behaviors. It's to be, to understand it. You know, it's just like, listen, that's, it's very natural. It was put in there for a reason to protect us, to survive, to get to where we're at. So to think just because we've, we've gotten, we've evolved. So we haven't evolved that much in the last hundred, a hundred years. We think that like, we're yeah. so different than what we were just 500 years, but in the grand scheme of, of time, how long we've oh, been our here. Our bodies are the same. Yeah. The same, but you take someone a thousand years ago, put them today, naked, nothing else. You can't tell that they're from a thousand years ago. They're it's modern person. It's it's all the same. Right. It's the the denying that they exist is a problem. Mm -hmm. Then that's also the problem where they exist. Therefore, this is how we should be. That's also a problem. Right. It's really what it is is uh, acknowledging that they exist, and then how do we work around that, and how do we become better? Mm -hmm. That's it. Because for example, it's animal. It's our human nature, animal instinct. To we just talked about doing the hard thing. It's our nature to do the easy thing. Mm -hmm. always do the easy, easy thing. So either A, we deny that that exists. Let's see how far that takes you. Yeah. Or we say, oh, this exists. There's four. I, this is the way I should be. Yeah. No, it's like this exists. These are why I have these drivers, but I can evolve beyond that. And well, it takes conscious effort and work. To deny that also too, it, it could be massively beneficial for you in a crisis situation would be, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, but like it, to deny that would just be like not true. Like it's not, it, it's something that, 
too, like will help you survive. It'll help you get out of like crazy, but also too, you have to acknowledge it so that you don't apply it to things that aren't That's really right. a crisis. You'd be naive to do that. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what, uh, for, for people watching who are like newlyweds, let's just say one of the most valuable things that you could do as a man or a woman is obviously you want to understand your partner. That's most important because they're an individual. But also understand, if you're a guy, how the female brain tends to work. And as a woman, understand how the male brain tends to work. We, we, we tend to deny it or pretend like it doesn't exist or it's wrong. And then you're screwed. If you're a guy and you constantly use the rationale uh, that you use for yourself or your buddies on your wife, you're going to think she's over, over emotional. Why doesn't she take my advice? Why does she keep saying these things to me? Doesn't she understand or whatever? If you're a woman and you do that to your husband, you're going to think, why does he act like an animal? Why does he forget everything? Why doesn't he care about whatever? Once you start to understand that there are differences in those brains. Now, of course, number one, understand that person you're with, but also understand that there's these general differences. You'll have a much easier, better time. That's yeah. it. Bottom line. It makes a huge difference. So denying these things is just, it's a problem as well. Well, this isn't like a, a complete example, but it's some of some bit of it. So I, I was up in San Francisco as well last night. Um, and I went to a concert, my favorite man came in town and I haven't been in San Francisco probably in a decade or so. Uh, wow. Has it really been that long? It's been that long. Wow. Yeah. And I, the last time was, yeah, it was probably, hmm, let's say it was about eight years ago. Okay. Cause I brought my kids up to like Ghirardelli square and all that. And like knew it was getting kind of rough in patches. Um, but it was completely eye-opening for me to see the state of where like union square where like a lot of people do like normal shopping um where you see just the over uh just homeless um union square's gotten that way it's there's not even like real it's customers drug, anymore. It's street drug central. It's in, drugs. In, on Union Square where all the Christmas shopping there and was all the human shit. Like, oh, wow. As I was walking down the street. Like, it's so bad, I, I was trying to find parking for like 30 minutes because all of the public parking uh, garages, like normally you'd be able to just go in a garage. And I was like, that's probably the move, right? You don't want to park on the street really. Um, we're now like private and they would bring the gate down and lock it. And so like, I, I kept trying to go in and like, there's a gate. And I'm like, what? There's a gate. It says on here, it's public. It wasn't public anymore. Um, and it, I had to end up parking on the street and I, we were walking and kind of like hustling, you know, through certain parts because there's like shopping carts, there's people walking in the street. There's just like, I, we saw people doing drugs, but there's this weird, like, um, also kind of dichotomy where you have uh, a playground and then there's kids in there like playing in this playground. And it just made me so sad. Like, cause directly across the street, you just saw just slums and, and just garbage and, and just like bottles. And, uh, I don't know, man, it, it was really depressing, but <laughs> I, I went to the concert and it was amazing, but it was just like, I just didn't, I guess I didn't realize like, it's gotten bad. Dude. It's gotten to that level. I didn't. Really I didn't bad. realize it. So I. I mean. I told you guys. I, have I can't bad. remember the last time I went to Union Square. It's probably been almost as long as you have because I only go down there literally for Giants and Warriors. So I just. You I drive in. And drive yeah. out. Well, yeah, and not only that, but that's if you know from coming from this area, that's you literally as soon as you come into San Francisco, you hit right there on the bay. And then you're, you're there. Yeah, yeah, I don't. So I haven't ventured to like, but Union Square. I remember going there. That's like one of the more, you know, beautiful areas. Bro, of they have San a Francisco section. Where, they, they have an area that's sectioned off for people to do <coughs> uh, to take and buy drugs on the streets. Yeah. Literally sectioned off, and, and and there's drug dealers in there, and they leave them alone. And you got, and it's a terrible situation because the vast majority of these people have severe mental illness. Yeah, and the the this is where. Uh, helping people can become um, toxic. What I mean by that is you're not helping people. You're, you're pretending to help people. Oh, we should leave them alone. Oh, you know, let them, do, it's like, you're not helping anybody. Yeah. These are mentally ill people that you're, you're actually, um, what's the word where you, you have a, like a enabling, you're enabling yeah. mm -hmm. and you're causing some terrible things that happen. And then the people in that whole city, man, this it's an exodus. Uh, it's like 30% vacancies in businesses. Yeah. Um, like I said, I, I told you guys, I have a family member that lives there where people leave their cars with the doors unlocked and windows down mm -hmm. so that people can just go through their cars so they don't get broken yeah. windows yeah. and they just don't leave valuables wow. in the car. I know. Wow. I yeah, know. Crazy. I know. It's kind of scary. Spot hero.
just so you know. Spot Hero. Oh, so that's a, a an app. So what we do um, is Spot Hero. Yeah, Spot Hero is this this app that we use that allows you to find like uh, people who like let you park in their garage or in their driveway or their home. Wow. So we'll pay her, her Katrina and I will pay a little hmm. bit pr premium to park at somebody's like private house that's like right there and a lot of people have done this they've converted like this guy that we parked in last oh, night he's converted his underground garage to like 10 or 14 spots and he actually has a valet guy who works there brilliant yeah and yeah making 100 150 bucks a spot or whatever for the i mean we're there for like five hours or whatever right for the game and stuff like that so you you park at that place there's like he has his own little valet thing he gets the he parks and it's gated so whenever there's games he's making a killing oh yeah i figured it was making like two thousand something a night every time there's a game wow. or an event. <clears throat> yeah wow. pretty it, upstairs yeah, really is his house and he's converted his whole lower level of his house into a parking garage that is very <laughs> smart. Yeah. And there's a bunch of them that do that. And they do it close to like areas where there's events uh -huh. because that, it's a popular thing to do down wow, there. Wow, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. You pay a little bit of a premium, but I mean, to know that it's yeah. got someone watching it the I entire time. I done that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I, and this venue wasn't like that big, right? So it was like kind of like I was really up in, you know, the, the thick of, of San Francisco. Uh, and uh, it was it was sketchy. It was very sketchy and there, but there was, I mean, again, I think the venue would have been a lot more full too, if it wasn't in such a sketchy place. Um, because it, you know, there was like some great bands playing and it's just, I'm like, this has got to be crazy even for people coming in and trying to uh, bring their fan base uh, to, to yeah. places like that. Like it's, it's crazy. To you me know, though. the argument, because there's this, uh, I'm not going to, we don't have to get too deep on this, but there's this like, uh, we need to pass laws to make it illegal to sleep on the street and throw these people in jail. And then this argument like, no, you, you know, we can't do that. These poor people, you know, we got to try to help them. And the way that we're helping them is by giving them needles and not throwing them in jail and that kind of stuff. Well, that's just it. It's not helping. No, I think there's a middle, which is like this. If we, uh, if we enable this, the cost to the city in terms of lost tax revenue from businesses, the cost to the city in terms of police and crime um, and lost residents if we took that and, and calculated it, I bet you, I bet you, you would save money mm -hmm. by publicly publicly funding mental health, mm -hmm. uh, uh, medical mental health. Yeah. By taking people like that and coming up with a way to where like, here, here's a deal. You've gotten caught twice doing this. Mm -hmm. Here's your options. We're going to either, you either go to jail or you go here and we're going to, we're going to, you know, take you off drugs and you're going to get this help and there's mental health services. Uh, I feel like, I, I, I would bet money that that would save money over what they're doing now. So, yeah. and why I make that argument Absolutely. is there's the side of the whole, like taxpayer shouldn't pay for it. And I'm usually on that side, but it's more expensive doing what they're doing now. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, a, it'll save money and it'll actually solve or m solve the problem more than what they're yeah. currently doing. You had a study that you wanted to Bro, sh share with us. Yeah, I do. Before I do, it's a good fitness and health study. Before I do, I do want to say this. Remember the last podcast? Where I said that uh, you know, corgasms is a real thing. <laughs> yes, I got. DMs. Did you see the comments? Yeah, I got you got DMs. I, I didn't got see DMs people talking about. Yeah, there's what were they people validating people it. People have experienced it. I mean, leg races women validating it. Leg yeah. raises. Leg raises was the common theme one. Yes. Yeah. No, leg it's not races? guys. Yeah, guys don't have corgasms. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Women do. Like, yeah, tons of comments under that video of messy. people like, oh, this is a real thing, and this is why I don't do that exercise, or this is why I do do that exercise. Yeah. So it's a real thing. All right, I got I got the study that. Well, God bless you if you, get, you I, can make that happen. Yeah, I do. <laughs> although that'd be embarrassing. In the world. You know, you're on rep <laughs> like, uh, I think I'm going to do the. Home I got gym five more today. reps. Yeah, yeah no. I got core to work on today. No, so I got this this study that is uh, pretty remarkable. This was in Nature.com, and they did this study on um, basically looking at total daily energy expenditure. Like, are we burning more or less calories uh, now in modern times than we were before? And first off, the answer is yes, we are burning less calories, but it's not because of reduced sedentary, activity. Yeah, okay. It's not because of reduced activity. Now, here's why, before I get into what the reason is. By the way, this just only supports what we've been saying for the yeah. last eight years on the podcast. Lack of muscle. Yeah. Uh, it's because when you burn calories through activity, your body quickly adapts, and then it learns to become more efficient. This is why that study that I bring up all the time mm -hmm. on the Hadza tribe shows mm -hmm. that these modern hunter gatherers don't burn that many more calories than the average couch potato because you can walk more, do all that stuff. There's health benefits to it. I'm not going to say there aren't health benefits, but in terms of calorie burn, your body quickly adapts. So what they found in the study 
was it's not because of reduced activity, because of the adaptation process, but rather because people have a declining basal expenditure, meaning <clears throat> less muscle. So the main reason why people are burning less calories today is not because they're moving less. It's because they got less muscle. Mm -hmm. Lack of muscle is one of the biggest contributors to what's happening with our health right now. When you have less muscle, you have less machinery to support with calories. Hormones organize themselves Differently, you have la you have worse uh, insulin sensitivity. Lack of muscle is one of the 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 main contributors to the the chronic health issues Dude, that we're suffering from now. So lifting weights, flag. yes, lift weights, strength training. This is like the modern solution, exercise portion of the solution for paired for with health. increased protein intake. Yeah, there's yeah. more, right? That's why yeah, I said yeah. it's part of the solution. Right. But when you look at the exercise side of this. It's like do strength. Whatever is beneficial, yeah, for building muscle. Yeah. Like, here we have a study. Um, imagine, yeah, imagine just like like somebody uh, like just as uh, everybody attempted one full body work workout routine a week and increased their protein intake. Just that's it. Yeah, just it. Like add a protein shake, do that, and watch as as a whole how much it would bring that number up. Oh. Just that that, that one. That, those two By the seven. way, I had lots of clients when I got good at this. I had lots of clients that only worked out with me once a week for the first two or three years. And of course, there were other changes that they made, but that once a week of strength training had some pretty significant impacts on their on their metabolisms. Just once, once it's a week. an area that I think we did a really poor job. I'm guilty of it too of of not actually celebrating even that, like making that seem like it's nothing still. Yeah, right. Because I was a young athlete trainer guy in my early 20s. If someone said they only worked out, I'd be like, oh, you're lazy. Yep. You know, that's not enough. Yep. You know, you're going to move the needle that way. But it's like now from my experience. Salad. I'm, God. Yeah, salad. <laughs> I'll have a salad. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's yeah. it's salad that's what Sal lately. I'll have a salad. Who? <laughs> yeah, steak in it. Yeah. <laughs> trying to cut, bro. I'm trying, to, uh, trying to cut down a little hey, bit. Hey, speaking of protein, today we have Organifi as our shout out. Oh, I got so, something to mention on that. Oh, yeah. Tell yeah, me yeah, that. yeah. No, along those lines. I keep seeing these uh, these carnivore advocates talk about the, uh, they call them toxins that you find in plants. So the argument goes- mm, Phytotoxins. Yeah. yeah, the argument mm. goes, um, you know, plants, they can't run, they don't have uh, claws or teeth. So their defense mechanism is producing compounds that make you not feel good or make you sick. This mm -hmm. is what, this is how they evolve to prevent themselves from being eaten. Unless it's fruit, fruit wants to be eaten because it's got seeds in it, but everything else- don't eat, and here's why, and here's why you shouldn't eat vegetables and plants. Um, and I can see some of the rationale behind it, but here's why it's wrong. First off, uh, most of us cook or process our plants. What I mean by process is like you take wheat, you don't eat wheat off the stock, that'll fuck anybody up, but you grind the hell out of it. And if, unless you have a gluten intolerance, then you can consume mm -hmm. it. People mm -hmm. have con been consuming wheat for thousands of years. Same thing with other plants and vegetables. So the cooking process helps. Uh, take get rid of some of that, but there's also something called the hormetic effect. Actually, one of you mentioned it earlier when we we're talking about. Excuse me. Was you okay? Yeah. Where some of the benefits of some of these these plants come from the fact that it is a mild stress in the body, right? But then your body strengthens as a result. So now, how does this t tie us to Organifi? The green juice that they make, I feel like one of the reasons why over time, I'm sure you guys have experienced this. If you take it regularly over time, you seem to feel better and better and better. Mm -hmm. It's ground up, it's freeze dried, it's able to be digested, but these are plants that probably have a lot of these compounds that produce some of this hormetic effect, which is why you'll get these compounding effects over time. So you take this green juice powder and you're giving your body, you know, getting the nutrients and stuff from the plants, but there's this mild hormetic effect that strengthens in, in your body over time. Now, I, I will back up and say that whole yeah. foods are always the best uh, choice uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff. But this is convenient. And like, if you're lacking vegetables in your diet and plants and you want to benefit from some of the benefits that you get from them, then this would be a good option. I would I would say that that paired with the fact that it has ashwagandha in there has yeah. to be the why people report back yep. so much positive. I mean, that's their number one seller is their green juice, By right? far. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's been that way for Reoccurring a sales too, like, or should I say purchases. People yeah. keep coming back yeah, yeah. for more and more. All right, I got a great shout out uh, for today. So um, there's this, uh, this is a podcast episode. So it's not a page. It's not a, you know. That's a, a good shot. I like that. This okay. is a specific episode that I listened to that mm -hmm. it's the only podcast. I'm going to pull it up because I want to make sure I say the, the guy's name right. It's the only single episode of a podcast that I've listened to over and over and over again. That's how, that's how impactful it was. 
the title of it, it's a word on fire. So word on fire is a, it's a religious podcast, but they'll have guests come on there and talk about other things. Um, and they had a guy named Chris Stefanik on and he talked about joy and, uh, wow, what a powerful, like, listen to this. If you're going through challenges in your life, you don't have to be Christian to benefit from it. So you can actually take the, some of that out, just hear the wisdom in there. And it's absolutely brilliant. He gives us one example, this analogy of like, he says that joy is deeper and much more, uh, it's deeper and it, it's, it sticks around even though you get emotions that come and go, which you can't control. Mm. So he uses the example of, he's a body surfer. And he goes, when I see a big wave coming, I dive down deep and grab the sand. He goes, it's real calm down there, even though above me is a bunch of turmoil. So he says, joy is something that, you've, that you have uh, all the time whether it's mm. challenge, sadness, whatever, the joy is much deeper than that. And he goes into this mm. whole talk about it. It's really, really cool. good. It's, it's Word on Fire, episode 377, How to Live with Joy with Chris uh, Stefanik. Interesting. Check that one out. Great. Hey, look, if you're interested in health and you're a parent, then you probably want your kids to be healthy as well. Well, these days it gets harder and harder to make sure your kid gets all their micronutrient needs, vitamins and minerals, especially if they're picky eaters. The problem is vitamin and mineral supplements for kids are typically just like gummy candies. They're just full of sugar and not very many nutrients. Well, there's a new company that we started working with called Haya Health that doesn't do this, right? So zero sugar, zero gummy junk. Um, it's actually well-dosed and appropriate for children. So it's a multivitamin for kids that's not candy. Go check them out and get a discount. Go to hayahealth.com forward slash mind pump. Haya is spelled H-I-Y-A um, and get 50% off your first order with that link. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Kate from Canada. Hi, Kate. How can we help you? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for all what you're doing. Just wanted to say that you're not just great trainers, but you're just amazing people. Oh, thank you. Thank I you. would say thank you to Adam for being such optimistic about our future. <laughs> it brings me hope, too. <laughs> and thank you so much, Sal and Justin, for all your controversial topics which are not controversial anymore we are discussing them at home too all right love it you got it so i'm 35 just started weightlifting um just uh on phase three of starter and i have a problem with my shoulders because i have joints hypermobility so it's like difficult really hard for me to keep them on uh, where they should be so it can be pop up easily my problem is mostly with arms and shoulders when I'm doing anything with like involve extra weight with my arms, it hurts. And like, I really sometimes feel it's going to pop up, especially when it's like my hand goes like out like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do this way because then it's going to be easier, but I'm not sure how right it is doing, doing wrong. And I was thinking to start anabolic but i'm not sure if i'm going to be able because of my shoulders should i just run starter second time um you you would be okay running starter again that wouldn't be a problem you can also start in pre-phase of anabolic also think but, symmetry would yeah, be good for yeah, but there's two things two pieces of advice that i think are going to do uh that will be really good for you one is and what i've worked with people with hypermobility shoulder joints are quite common sore the hips slow your reps down that's number one. Number two, shorten your range of motion. So don't try to do your full range of motion, but make it a little bit shorter. And then the third thing I'm going to say is isometrics are mm. going to be your best friend. Beautiful. So That's why I like symmetry. Yeah, a great exercise for you for like shoulders would be to hold the dumbbell straight up over your head and create tension or hold it right where you feel like it might be a little unstable, but then just hold the weight there and create tension or create tension at the bottom position where you're supporting it with the muscle. Isometrics are going to be excellent for someone like you because, and this is just where you hold the weight in a position and connect to the feeling of, of, of tension. That's going to help you create stability quite a bit. That by far is the most, that'll be the most valuable thing thing that I tell you right now is to utilize isometrics in your daily training because that's going to help a lot with that stability. Do you think like, because each phase has different um, repetition, like sometimes it's up to eight, sometimes up to 12. Is it better for me to lower the weight and have more repetition 
the, no, I, the idea is to follow the program the way it's laid out. So if we have it, if we have it with lower reps, the idea is that you increase weight, and then when it has higher reps, you lower the weight. So you want to you want to follow the program the way it's laid out, and not change it and necessarily modify it. Where I would modify it for you is, it, especially when we're doing shoulder stuff, is. I would actually do that kind of isometric pause in every exercise that's with my shoulder. So if you have a shoulder press exercise, I would, you know, pause at the bottom for a second or two, press, pause at the top for a second or two, and then come down. And so I would create these isometric holds in every exercise that we, you know, yeah, even like a lateral raise, we'd raise, I'd have you hold and then come down. And so you would have to do a little bit lighter weight in order to follow the rep count to do that. But all shoulder exercises, mm -hmm. I would have you do that one modification. But in the program, when we have you move from, you know, eight to 10 reps to then 15 to 20 reps, you want to follow the program in the way it's laid mm -hmm. out. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the great, greatest advice is the isometrics from those different positions, from the rack position, you know, from out wide and then. Uh, overhead. Uh, and two, you can, you can also like work on that as well with a cable. So uh, let's say, you know, you're able to then have it on a, a top position. And so it's also like you're pulling down and just holding and isometrically squeezing that weight in place. Same thing out wide, same thing overhead, uh, just so you get that contrast and you get that connectivity there where your your shoulder is is really just trying to focus on creating that kind of tension to be able to brace and keep everything uh in place uh and yeah i mean th there's a way to intensify that if it gets to a point where you're pretty good and you're pretty solid with that where uh, if you have access to a kettlebell, I just love having, um, you know, those same positions with a, a bottoms up position. So it really intensifies the uh, stability where it's going to be pulling you left to right in rotation. So it's going to it's going to challenge you a lot in terms of like balance and, and control. Um, so you can go light with that because it, it really is like a, a, an incredible challenge uh, to be able to hold that. But yeah. I mean, other than that, like just, you know, working your way through that with the mobility uh, rotational type exercises that you can apply, just really focus on slow, uh, controlled, mm. creating tension. Every every incremental movement with that, you're just squeezing and trying to connect to that uh, muscle tension. Yeah, you're with the, with the wraps. I mean, it's always going to be appropriate weight. So if you did good technique and control for 15 reps, and then the program says you got to do eight reps you still want to have good technique and control. You just add weight that allows you to do that appropriately. That's all. So it doesn't mean you go crazy with the weight. It's always appropriate weight. Okay. So low reps aren't going to be inherently more dangerous for you than higher reps. In fact, I can sometimes make an argument that higher reps can sometimes become uh, a little bit more risky for somebody with hypermobility. In fact, when I trained people with hypermobility, I would train quite often in the low rep ranges and we wouldn't max out, but I would just have them learn how to create lots of tension. But your best friend, Kate, is going to be isometrics, okay? So okay. take your exercise. Yeah. Adam gave great advice. Stop the rep, you know, where you feel a little instability, create tension, squeeze, try and make mm -hmm. it feel stable, and then complete the rep. Um, if you need to go lighter to do so, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But isometrics are what's going to help you create the stability more than anything. So I would, I would definitely place an emphasis on those for the shoulder exercises. Great. Thank you so much. It's just like discouraging because squat, I kind of progress well, but with arms, I cannot progress at all. Well, let me ask you this. You, you, you maybe aren't adding weight to the dumbbells, but do you feel more stable with the exercise in your shoulders? A little bit, yes. Okay, then you progressed. Yeah. So we, we don't okay. always measure progress by the weight on the bar. You know, progress comes in many mm -hmm. different ways, and sometimes it's just, I can do it now or I feel better now, or I feel safe now. Okay. That's also progress. So, and, and nobody progresses. There, there's nobody whose entire body progresses exactly the same way. Everybody has areas that progress more with weight than others, or you got to focus on stability more than other areas. That's normal. So uh, don't beat yourself okay. up you know, over that. Perfect. Thank you so much for your answers today. No problem, Kate. Right. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. We we need to we need to like I mean isometrics is so underutilized. Yeah. I think I don't think people really realize what, the value. We've been championing it for a while. I yeah. mean it's just it's hard to convey uh you know how effective they are and how important they are. 
um, because it's just it's part of that unsexy part of training yep. where yep. you just you overlook it a lot, but the benefits are are incredible. It's because it's hard to explain what's going on. So I actually just a real smart guy. I had this. Yeah, because you're standing still. Well, like <laughs> so, I had this. I I had this uh, this guy that I ran into. I hadn't seen in a long time. Real real smart. Uh, I think engineer and investor dude shoulder issues and i was trying to explain to him uh and he's like oh yeah, yeah. And i was trying to tell him like like the mobility stuff that we have yeah. and, and what i'd be doing with him and everything that he's like oh no no, no. yeah i stretch i stretch my shoulder all the time I'm like well there's a difference let me say and mm -hmm. I, uh, mobility is different and there's a, there's an isometric component in the mobility exercises that i'd have you do oh and he kept like like cut me off and i'm like no let me explain what's going on and why and he's just like oh yeah well i get this quarter zone. i'm like stop it's, like, <laughs> it's just that it's it's for the the average person it's hard to communicate and this is what i explained to him it's like your humor you have to understand your humor is like floating right in there it's not like it's uh it's it's a the, the shoulder and the the hip are like the most complex joints in our the body shoulder yeah. even has a scapula involved yeah. and all kinds capable of, it. of the most range of motion right so it has this ability to and it's and and what it's doing when you have someone like that's hypermodal it's like all over the place and so what we're doing with isometrics is we're trying to get all those muscles that are around the shoulder to wake up and fire and to help stabilize it and keep it more stable in there so it's not all over the place and so doing something like an isometric move, like if you just load the bar and keep loading the bar, it's still going to be all wobbly and all over the place. But if we can do an isometric contraction and we can recruit as many of these muscles around the shoulder to help get them firing and support that, this is going to help you in that pursuit. So even though you're not moving a bunch of weight and you're just staying in a fixed position and you're trying to contract and, iso and do this isometric contraction there, you're getting tremendous benefit for what you're, you're trying to accomplish. I think it's just understanding what's going on is why people, because they don't feel like they're doing anything. Mm -hmm. They're just holding in this position. It's like, how is this really helping yeah. my shoulder? I think yeah, really, it's it's about the effort you're putting in in those positions more so than just like holding something. Like you have to really actively connect to that and, and mm -hmm. increase, uh, you know, that recruitment process. So it's really like it's squeezing a bit harder, a bit harder, a bit harder, like intensify it yourself. You have to put the effort in. Our next caller is Emily from New York. Hi, Emily. How can we help you? Hi, um, my name is Emily. I'm 21, new, 21 years old from Buffalo, New York. And I have a question about what my training focus should look like while I'm prioritizing my gut health. So I'm currently working with uh, Dr. Becky Campbell to work through my SIBO, leaky gut, IBS, all of the things. And I don't know what to focus on right now in terms of working out. Um, I've been really frustrated the past two years uh, with my lack of progression in the big three lifts. And I didn't realize until I was listening to you guys that it was probably my gut health kind of holding me back. Um, and I finally accepted earlier this year that I probably should step away from the intensity of chasing PRs all the time. And so I decided to focus on other things like my pistol squat, um, progressing single leg RDLs, um, working on my hip mobility, just some other things instead. Um, that being said, my primary goal is to get back to training heavy because I, I really love that. And I still want to put on muscle. So how soon is too soon for me to focus on this again? And like what other skills should I work on in the meantime to best set myself up? For success when I go back to training heavy and should I still be in this muscle gain mindset or is that kind of just deterring me from getting better how how far are you with Dr. Becky Campbell's team with working uh with your gut issues did you just start yeah we we've only recently met within the past month um but I've been working with other doctors on this for like two years so it's been been a long time. Have you done antibiotics? Oh yeah. No, I think that was part of the part of the issue. I was on antibiotics for like four years for my skin oh. and they never told me yeah. that they could totally mess me. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're, you're young, so you're going to bounce real quick. Um, but, um, how big of a role do you think stress plays with your gut issues? Because I, I see your question, that you're a you're going to school for neuro neuroscience. Yeah, no, I'm about to graduate in like four days, so 
Okay. I, yeah, I'm a senior in college. <laughs> and then you're gonna are you gonna keep going? Or are you gonna go to Are you gonna go for a master's PhD? Or are you done? I'm taking a gap year or two to get more clinical hours, and then I'm gonna go back to school to be a PA. So hopefully to work in functional medicine, but under a DO doctor. Okay. So you you're, you're you got some stress on you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I try my best to manage it. Um, I love to walk. That really helps me. And I started doing breath work in the morning and that helps, but it's hard to not be stressed out. Yeah. I think, okay. So, so here's what I'm going to say. You're working with, with Dr. Becky Campbell. She's one of the best in the business. Um, you just started working with her. So there's a process of killing off the, the bad bacteria, rebuilding up good bacteria. Then there's a process of healing, which takes a little while. That places a large stress on the body. And if you're already stressed, uh, exercising with a goal of, per, you know, progressing in performance is probably not a good idea. So I would treat exercise right now as a way to just make yourself feel good. Yeah. Recuperative, you know, so like two days a week of full body strength training would be great. Now what probably is going to happen and I don't, I wouldn't rest your hat on this, but what might happen is you'll actually progress just from taking a little break, but I would go two days a week, full body. And the rest of the time I would work on just mobility and just feeling good. Mobility, That's all I would do. Walking, yoga, more recuperative. Yeah, you know, manage manage that stress bucket a little bit better. It's a really hard question to answer because it, it it's so individualized based off of how how fast and how well you progress with Becky Campbell. Now, the the one thing that I would caution, is, and it, this is actually no different than somebody who just tore an Achilles or the MCL or ACL, and you start rehabbing. The tendency that we have is we start rehabbing, we start feeling better, and then we start wanting to push our limits, and then we have this massive setback. We see the same thing with gut health. Yeah, somebody does starts working with a, a functional practitioner, they start making good food choices, they're starting to feel really good, and then they start chasing the PRs again, and then they have this big setback again. And so you're just going to have to really listen to your body and be careful of being tempted to want to push as soon as you feel a little bit better. I would just slowly inch my way up in that direction before I throttle down. And or if you start to inch your way up and you start noticing little setbacks, listen to your body and go back the other direction versus trying to force your way through it just because you feel a little bit better. So I'm so glad you said that, Adam. That's such a big point because you'll you, you through the treatment process or through this process, you will feel better. You'll start to absorb nutrients better. And you're going to feel strong, and, but the healing process hasn't it hasn't been completed yet. So what Adam said is extremely important. If you continue to work with Dr. Becky Campbell's team, they will, through testing, be able to advise you and tell you you're doing too much uh, when it comes to exercise or stress. So I would ask for their feedback as well. Hey, I feel like I can do more. What do you think? What do my tests say? Well, your cortisol is a little high. Inflammation is still high. I think we should back off. Or yeah, everything looks good. Go ahead and inch it up. A little bit, um, so I would definitely use their uh, their discretion in terms of you know how how hard you should go. But uh, but I mean generally speaking, Maps Anabolic the two day week version would be perfect. I would do that, and then the rest of the time work on mobility and just being generally active. And I don't think you're going to see your body backslide at all. So if you're worried about like oh my god I'm gonna lose mm -hmm. muscle and gain body fat, what will probably happen is you'll probably actually move forward a little bit through that. So yeah, that's the silver lining when you, when you're able to actually go through the healing process, like how much better your body operates and functions and, you know, will allow you to throttle up a bit more in terms of like force production. So it'll all come back. It's just, you got to give your body that adequate time to really heal itself. Yeah. Did you, what did you test for SIBO with Dr. Becky Campbell? So they were able to positively identify that that's what you, what you got going on. Yeah. <clears throat> I tested positive uh, over the summer and then I tested positive in the winter and then we just ran another test. So it's been present for a while. Okay. Okay. You know, with SIBO and CIFO, which is related is that you'll see that you'll get rid of it, but then you, there's a process of continuing to work, work where it doesn't come back because the reoccurrence rate is so high because I think people celebrate too quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, that was me. That was me too. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's a longer process than people realize, but the hard part is in the beginning. Once you figure it out and how to treat it, um, and work with it, then you'll see a lot of progress, but then don't lay off the throttle and be like, Oh, like, like, that's what I would do. Like, Oh, I feel better. Let me go eat all these things that I, that I know used to bother me. 
let me not do the protocol anymore. And then boom, I'd get a reoccurrence again and just over and over again. So I forgot who it was we had on the show. It was the functional medicine practitioner that worked yeah. with the. Uh, They're usually like, it's like a two year. He said it's like a year or two. Yeah. You know, year or two Sometimes. process. Yeah. That, that doesn't mean you don't get better faster. You do. It's just, a, it's still, there's still that after care you that you to need keep to do. Considering that it. was Will Cole. Will Cole, Will Dr. Cole, Will Cole. Right. Did you listen to that episode? Um, I've been listening for like a year and a half, so probably. Okay, cool. <laughs> it was in there. All right, good. Well, you're yeah. on the right track if you're working with the right people. So I think, uh, do you have MAPS anabolic? Um, I don't have anabolic, but I was wondering, would MAPS performance be too much if I did two of those days? Uh, no, that's mm -hmm. perfectly fine. Do you have yeah. mass performance? Um, I don't have that. All right. I'm going to yeah. send you anabolic and performance. So you take your pick. Okay. Yeah. Either one would be good for you. For awesome. sure. Thank you guys so much. You got it. Um, Go ahead. Can I ask, can I ask one more question? Sure. So I ran map symmetry over the winter as like my first step of kind of taking taking my intensity back because I was running like a power lifting program and I, I could tell that I was getting really unsymmetrical and also my stomach and all of that. So I decided to run map symmetry, but with all of the mobility, it kind of seems like one of my hips has unlocked a certain level of mobility and my other one hasn't. So I've noticed I've been shifting a little bit with my squats uh, so, performance. Yeah, not sure. What do mass performance. Perform yeah. yeah, do mass performance and symmetry would even be a good program to go back to. It could take a little longer. Yeah. So, how long did you do powerlifting training before you went into symmetry? Um, I did it for it was about four months. Before that, I ran mass strong, and then I wanted I kind of wanted to do strong as a precursor to powerlift. So then I did that, and I could just feel the imbalances kind of coming on. So I knew yeah. it was time yeah. to do symmetry. It, it may just need that a little bit more of that attention yeah. of, of uh, lateral stability, rotational stability of, of really getting it familiar of how, you know, it, it, in terms of if you're in the sagittal plane quite often, and then now all of a sudden you're introducing these other ranges of motion and not quite getting strong with that yet. Like it may need a little bit more attention in that direction. Yeah. And I, I can, I just want to comment on a, a college uh, a, a girl your age in college, your choice of programs is amazing. Yeah. Usually young young women are like, you know, hit and cardio and whatever. You're like strong, power lift, you know, <laughs> symmetry, like good job. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, those, are the, those, those are the right programs. But I think symmetry and, and performance will probably be the ones that you're going to benefit from most in that regard. Take a look at your feet too, Emily, when you squat. Pay attention to many times when we'll see issues or discrepancies in like one hip or the other. It Good actually point. stems a mm -hmm. lot of times yep. all the way from the feet and it'll do this kind of zigzag thing. So if it's my right foot, then it jumps to my left knee to my right hip. Mm -hmm. So when you pay attention the next time you're squatting and, and you see this kind of asymmetrical shift you're talking about and see if you notice something in the feet, many times on the uh, opposing side, you will see that foot's pronating more or it has like this external rotation excessively in comparison to the left. And there might be some hip ankle stuff for us to address that will actually eliminate and alleviate some of the stuff going on in the hip. Yeah. Great point. Awesome. Cool. Thank you guys so much. All right. All right. Thanks for calling in dude. So, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the, those acne, uh, antibiotics, uh, they'll put them on for years. It's like a little nuclear bomb. In oh, your stomach, you huh? annihilate your gut annihilate if yeah, you people don't you, you need to, if before you do something like that read people's accounts of of how what happened to them afterwards those are like one of the worst treatments in my opinion and i i know acne can be you know something terrible to deal with but um do your research on that man you are nuking your your gut for a while to get rid of acne and then you're left with these crazy after effects i've, I've worked with clients and it's like oh my gosh this is going to be really hard. Yeah. The one thing I just cautioned her with, I think I made the point already, just going to double down on it is that, you know, we, and I just find this with the gut, with injuries, uh, like I was talking about with the knee or hip or ankle, like, you know, we have this tendency of when we rehab, we start feeling better to like want to push the limits right away. And then mm -hmm. that's when the, the setbacks come. So it's no different for the gut. Someone starts Especially to somebody's performance driven. Like yeah, that. that's yeah, why that's, I, that's why I feel yeah. that way. Right. She's got that kind of athletic mindset. Go get her right. Type A personality probably. 
So starts feeling better with the gut and then starts either one, introducing those foods that were, you mm-hmm. know, mess, messing around before or pushing the limits in the weight room or the combination of both, yeah. right? Start introducing the foods plus push limits and then you have this huge setback. And then a lot of times these clients think that, oh, the functional medicine thing didn't really work. You know, and they and they go back to like no. thinking like, oh, it's not that's it's a bunch of BS. It's not really helping me, but it's like, no, you got to stick to it a lot longer than that. Our next caller is Aaron from Colorado. Hi, Aaron. How can we help you? Hi, guys. Hey. So I just want to start out with the obligatory thank you. Uh, I've been listening for about a year now, and you guys have not only changed my life but my husband's, and I feel like we're finally on the right track. So thank you. Awesome, awesome. rad. So I wrote in, I started anabolic last September and I started with the two day a week version. And then I redid it again with the three day a week version. Um, Before that, I'm pretty new to weightlifting. So uh, the first round, I kind of felt like it was just getting handle on things. Um, And then on my trigger days, I do trigger sessions and then I do mobility work from Prime and Prime Pro. Um, I do Adam's Prime Pro video a lot because I feel like it's just pretty much covers Superior. everything that I need to work on. Um, so the reason why I wrote in, though, is because the last six weeks or so, I'm really starting to notice that I'm crooked. Uh, my left shoulder is about an inch higher than my right shoulder right now. And I think it might be stemming from my right shoulder rolling forward. And then I notice on my lower half, my right foot really points out like when I squat or just when I'm standing. Um, Even if I try and correct it when I squat, uh, by the time I'm done squatting, it's back out pointing farther than the left one. So my plan was to move on to performance next. Um, So I was just kind of wondering if that is still the right way to go or if I should focus on something else or... I say symmetry. I just, we got the right program for you, Aaron. S- symmetry. Uh-huh. <laughs> Map symmetry will do. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll take care of all that. Symmetry coupled with Prime Pro, I think, is your answer. Yeah. So okay. you follow symmetry the way it's laid out, and then you can go to performance next. Then um, you can follow the the program. But I think symmetry is gonna. It'll take care of what you're talking about. If it doesn't the first time around, do it again. But that's that's okay. your best bet. Mm-hmm. By far. You can use some of the stuff in Prime Pro, like to to complement symmetry, right? So I'd run symmetry the way it's laid out, and then because you have Prime Pro, you know we're talking about shoulder and uh, ankle, hip stuff. Like you could do movements in there. So on your off days, or like you can't you can't really do too much of the corrective mobility work. So no. um, you know, look at some of the exercises that we have for shoulder, hip, and ankle um, for some of those issues. And then you know, if you have time in between stuff you're doing at work or at home or, you know, on your off days, like feel free to do that prime pro stuff as, as much as you possibly can and then follow symmetry laid out. And I think we should see some, some of that come together. Yeah, Take some of those internal rotational, like mobility exercises, keep those banks. So that way you bring them in as like your primers going forward towards your workouts. Uh, And I know like performance will kind of highlight that a bit too with, uh, you know, some rubber bands and things to be able to kind of get that connectivity established, uh, you know, first thing. So that way too, you're going to perform at your highest throughout your workout. Do you know what he means by that, Aaron? What he meant by that? Like we're, so take your shoulder, shoulder, hip and like ankle, you know, from prime pro that you like the best or that you, you, you you could take from the video I did. That's fine. Also 90, 90. So take, okay. take those movements and those become like staple movements you do before you do any workout in symmetry. So you start, that's how you would start. You start by doing some of those. That's your warm up. That's right? your warm up every time before okay. you work out. And then you go into the symmetry program. So, and, and, and then of course, yeah. if you got more time to do it throughout the day, do it even more, but at least before you go to lift, start every workout first with those, you know, three main mobility movements to address those areas. It's just like anything else. We're teaching the body to respond appropriately. So it takes a lot of reps. And so to do a lot of reps with like not much damage or intensity, like that's where mobility is like your best friend to be able to kind of constantly introduce that in everything you do until the the problem sort of resolves itself. Yeah, symmetry is the best program though. You follow that and you'll start to see things balance out for sure. Just remember to start with the weaker side. So every exercise that's unilateral, Right, every exercise that's like one side and then do the other side. Start with the weaker side and then let that weaker side dictate the weight 
and the reps for the stronger side. Even if it feels easy for the stronger side, follow okay. the weaker side. That'll balance you out. Okay. So is symmetry like anabolic where it has like trigger days too, or no, symmetry, I just symmetry is symmetry is a, is, is a different program. So just follow it as it's laid out. Don't do it. Don't, you don't need to add anything to it. The only thing you could add is what I was saying about yeah, the, the warm ups with the, 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 the warm ups. Yeah. The warm ups. You can do that on off days as, as much as you can. Mm -hmm. it's, we're just getting better connectivity. We're working on mobility range of motion there. So the more you do that, the better off you're going to be. So that is your, if you have time or you got, oh, I got a free day today, go do your, do your prime pro work, do, do more of that. Have you, you said you're kind of new to strength training. Is this your first time ever doing strength training? Yeah. Before this, I did, uh, the 30 beach body program. So it was mostly just light dumbbell work. Sure. So, so this is in this, by the way, don't feel bad. Okay. This is why there, this is part of the reason, not all the reason, but this is part of the reason why there's so much value in working with a really good trainer or coach, because what you're noticing is very normal. If I take okay. anybody who's never done strength training and have them progress through the big lifts, which are all bilateral, meaning both arms, both legs, you right. will see imbalances between the right and left because we start out that way. And so a good trainer is able to spot that and work on them as you're continuing to progress. So don't feel bad. This is very, ex this is expected. Not only that, this is why we created symmetry. I, I mean, I think you should commend yourself already. The fact that you had the awareness to have prime and have prime pro, and you're asking a question like this. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of people just, they just, just keep going, just keep on going and just ignore that. There's this imbalance from one side to the other. The fact that you're aware of it already working towards it, want to know how to program yeah. around it is a, is a great sign. You're going to move in the right direction. So I love hearing that. Yep. Thank you. You yeah. got it. We're sending that to you. Okay. Uh, awesome. Thank you guys so much. All right, right, thanks, Aaron. Aaron. Thank you. Take care. Do you guys get the feeling we prevented a divorce? I think <laughs> she's like, now we're back. We're on the Between right track. Between that and the Ulers, yeah. you know. <laughs> All right. I feel like we have a lot I of mean, success. We're there. keeping marriages together. Yeah. You know, I I tell you, um, this just for anybody listening, you know, there there really is nothing more valuable than having a really good coach or trainer yeah. train you because. Everybody's body responds a little differently. I would like all of us in this room would would have seen this before it became obvious to her. Now, to for the late for the average person, when it becomes an obvious discrepancy, there were signs that were already there way before. They just didn't necessarily notice them. Right. And a good trainer would stop it before it progressed into something that you know the average person could notice. I do want to point out though that that is the the difference between a good trainer and a great trainer though right that's there. right it's it's like you I would, can see this before it becomes yeah, a problem i mean that when i think of uh the the first five to ten years versus the back five to ten years um this is the big difference is you know i, I as a trainer in my early career it was all around you know what's your goal i want to look a certain way yeah. i want to lose weight i want to build muscle yep. macros and intensity pushing and, these and, things didn't become issues in the, until they became big issues yes and, and so versus the you know the more experienced trainer is let me see you move and then i see how they move yeah. and immediately i'm already addressing this type of stuff right. so uh, I, I mean definitely if you can find a trainer that mm -hmm. is experienced like this they're worth their weight in gold our next caller is Marco from Italy. Marco, how's it going? How can we help you? Hey, yeah, wrapping it. Hey, guys. Buongiorno, Sal. Hey. <laughs> how's it going? Good. How are you? We're doing good. What can we do for you? Yeah, my question is about uh, MOPS programs and fasting. So I'm a great fan of fasting, mainly for the spiritual benefits. I'm a little bit of a freak. I spent the last few years studying Taoist practices and meditation, but I love working out as well. And so I was wondering, since I started recently anabolic for the first time, and I feel my metabolism is way higher, way stronger, I, I'm eating way more, and it feels great, I'm stronger. I still would like to introduce some, I don't know, two, three, three days fasting once in a while, like once every month or every other month. Would you, would you suggest not doing that or reducing that since uh, one of the purposes of the program is that of increasing metabolism? No, I, no, I, I love this. You're fine. I, yeah. I, you know, if you go back far enough, Sal was on this kick for a while where he was fasting every month. 
on a, like a two to 72 three, hour fast. Yeah. yeah two to three yeah. day fast. Yeah, he once would do, a month. Once a month he would do this. And, yeah, I remember. and, and there's tremendous benefit, especially since you're the, for the purposes that you're doing it, you don't have this weird relationship with food. And it's not going to slow your metabolism. No, down. not, no. it's not going to slow your metabolism down. It's not going to hurt your gains. Even in fact, I think, uh, I, and I would, I would time it like, so that this is how I do, especially if you're at the spiritual practice, right? So the day that the three days you decide to fast, this would be a more recuperative week. I'd also make that my kind of my deload week. So you'd have this, you'd bring mm. back the intensity a little bit on your, your weight training. You'd focus on meditation, your yeah. spiritual or even practices. No, no weight training. Yeah, or none. That's what I mean yeah. by that should be your deload week. So deload that week or like really scale it back. And I mean, I would think of that like this is my week of working inward for a week. And that's going to be the focus, eating eating no food and then meditating, things like that. And then when I come out of it, I'm back to refeeding and training hard. I bet you'd see tremendous yeah. strength Probably gains, great for things for metabolism, all yeah, positive. Health, health will be positive. Everything everything will work out well. I think that'll be, that's a perfect, uh, that's perfect advice right there. Marco. That's amazing. I have a question for you. How, because yes. I know you're in Italy right now. So I need to ask you this yes. question. Um, what does your mom think about when you fast? How do you tell this to your mom? What, what is her reaction when you tell her, no, mom, I'm not going to eat for the next three days. <laughs> she throws something at you. <laughs> Look, uh, this is even funnier. I'm back at my mom's for a few months and uh, she's fasting with me. Oh. And she's coming to the gym with me now. So she's working out. Wow. She's, oh, awesome. she's a keep Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. My grandma killed me probably. <laughs> <laughs> what part of Italy are you in? Um, near Genoa on the right at the frontier with France on the coast. Oh, good. Gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, yeah. on those days you fast, I mean, the goal is, as you said, spiritual, mental, um, the exercise I would do on those days is walking. I would spend time outside, mm -hmm. uh, stretching, yeah. yoga, that kind of stuff. And then when you're done with the fast, get back to your strength training. I mean, you did that once a month, you would get great. There would be no problems at all. Fantastic. Because I, I just finished phase one and I just wanted to fast so bad. I did it. And I thought, put it between phase one and phase two or at the end of the whole program. Because they, they last a month, each phase, more yeah. or less. Yeah. Three, four weeks. Marco, thank you. you. By the way, I just got today the t shirt and the hat. Oh, it just yeah, looks good on you. you look good. Good Marco, time. Marco, do you have Maps Anabolic Advanced? No. No, I don't. Okay, I'm going to send that to you because in MAPS Anabolic Advanced, there's a week of deload in between each phase. That would be a perfect time for yep. you to do a fast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. You got it. And one last thing. Uh, of course, everybody says thank you for everything. But especially, I want to say thank you. And I heard it on the podcast as well that uh, was released, I think, yesterday or two days ago. You guys are, uh, all of you, a great example for us young men uh, of fatherhood, of manliness, with, uh, in my opinion at least, the great a great balance between uh, strength and determination and all these very masculine qualities and being vulnerable, being humble. It's great to have uh, people like you to look up to. Thank you very much. Thank you very wow. much, Marco. I appreciate I think, that. Yeah, that's a nice compliment. Thank man. you. All right. The good work. Thank you. All right, Thank you, Mark, right, you too. Thank you. We definitely are the most humble people I know. <laughs> <laughs> where, where's it coming place. up with that? We're the first place humble. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else, okay, yeah. cool. But yeah, yeah I, know, that's funny. I had to ask him about what his mom said because I know. Him, I mean, in my culture, like, that's no, great. No, I'm not that's gonna funny. eat. Oh my hey, that's god, crazy. he got, got his mom on board. I yeah, know. he got Much. his mom fasting, and he said, "You know, yeah. I actually." foresee us in the future, not the near future, before I get all the comments. So yeah, that relax. writing a program like this where we integrate health, Yeah, it's like focus. it's like a longevity health more focus. Yeah. And I think I would totally do this where there's a one to three day fast every single month. He's a like bit this. ahead of the curve with this. Yeah, sure. no, that's a what a what a great, great balance, you know? And mm -hmm. so I think that would be a, a really cool thing to hear how that goes for him. That's awesome. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our fitness guides. We have a lot of free fitness guides that can help you with all kinds of fitness goals. Also, come join us on Instagram. Find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. Find me at Mind Pump DeStefano. And find Adam at Mind Pump Adam. 
Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 